Yes, this is Introduction to Anthropology, the lecture on early human evolution. Wish we could have this in a face-to-face -face class, but I hope you are finding these lectures useful. Um, this lecture is basically about our earliest ancestors. Pictured um, is the fossil and uh, reconstruction of what the fossil would have looked like, Ardipithecus. So let's begin. have here is a timeline and as you'll see many of um, there's many fossils um, and so I want to go over it because I'm going to be combining um, and what we're going to look at is general evolutionary trends and not memorize all these different fossils names but let's look to start with we're going to start with the Ardipithecus group this is um, right here and their dates can go as early as 5.8 million years ago and as late as 4.4 million you will not get a question on the dates it's just to help you kind of see this um, in your mind now then we move to the australopithecine groups and this is an area under active scientific investigation so we're finding new fossils all the time and uh, many more individuals of existing fossils. We know quite a bit about this group, and this group dates from 4.4 million years ago to about 1.4 million years ago. They split into two groups. One of them is often referred to as the robust Australopithecines, but we're gonna use the genus name Paranthropus. This group will last from 2.6 million years ago 2.6 million years ago and eventually go extinct. Our lineage is the other one from the Australopithecines that leads to the genus Homo. And as you see, we have many, many uh, relatives. Um, these lectures are just going to talk about early um, Ardipithecus, the Australopithecines, and the robust Australopithecines. And we'll have another lecture for the genus Homo. Now, this is how Ardipithecus would have looked. And for most of you, when you look at this, what you see is an ape-like creature, and very much so. Ardipithecus had a brain, face, and general appearance of an ape. See the large brow ridges? But more importantly, Ardipithecus doesn't have a forehead, and Ardipithecus has a brain that's only slightly larger than a chimpanzee today. Okay, this gives you some of the descriptions of where Ardipithecus lived. They lived in Eastern Africa. They were quadrupeds in the trees, so they kind of did this walk crawl through the tree. They're bipeds on the ground. And that is the central characteristic that, put that puts them in our ancestral lineage, that and their teeth, okay? They have small canines in both males and females. And they lived in a woodland environment and made, ate many different types of food. Here I want you to look at one of the key characteristics for Ardipithecus, and that's that they are becoming bipedal. Um, so they have the ability to stand upright and walk on two legs, okay? But look at their foot. Their foot is still very adapted to the trees. They have an opposable big tom, so their foot can grasp tree limbs. They also have very long arms. They are fully adapted to tree life. They just have several modifications that allow them to walk upright bipedally. This shows you a reconstruction. So good bipedal walkers, but good tree climbers. Um, another characteristic that puts them in our ancestral lineage is the tooth change that they are experiencing. Um, and that tooth change is basically that they are getting thicker dentition enamel on their teeth. Here shows you kind of um, a human on the left with the human teeth. And then it shows you the thickness of the enamel on a molar. 
On the right is a chimpanzee and the thickness of the enamel. The blue and green indicate their enamel is not very thick. And part of the reason for that is chimps have this very large canine. And when they chew, they cannot grind their teeth. The canine's interlock. Here's the lower canine, here's the upper canine. So basically all they can do is chomp up and down. That doesn't require a thick enamel. We, on the other hand, have a canine, but our canine is small. And this allows us to grind our teeth, to grind, finely grind plant material in our mouths. This requires a lot of protection for the teeth and thick enamel. And Artipithecus is right between modern humans and chimpanzee. Their canine is much reduced, both the upper and the lower. They have the ability for grinding motion in their jaw, and their enamel is becoming thicker and thicker. About 4 million years ago, Australopithecines evolved in East Africa. So what we're doing here is we're comparing an Australopithecine on the left with Artipithecus on the right. Let's look at the Australopithecines. Now, when we talk about Australopithecines, I'm going to be focusing on the species called Australopithecus afarensis. There's a very famous fossil find within this group. There's hundreds of fossils of Australopithecus afarensis, but the, one of the first ones found was called Lucy. And so Lucy is very much associated with this species. Now, again, look at this reconstruction of Lucy. Again, the big brow ridges, very much an appearance of an ape, looks more like a chimpanzee or a bonobo than a human. But what you're starting to get here is a larger, more complex brain. Um, starting to see subtle increases in brain size throughout the middle millions of years that Australopithecines evolved. So let's take a look at them. Another big change is Australopithecines teeth are becoming more and more human-like. So this is a chimpanzee. They have these large canines, both upper and down. This is the lower jaw, okay? And they have kind of what we call a V-shape to their jaw. This is a human. We have very small canines. We also have a dental arch that is U-shaped, okay, U-shaped. And we have small square teeth that are have thick enamel for grinding. Australopithecines are starting to develop that U-shaped structure. Their canine is much reduced. Their teeth are getting square and the enamel is getting much thicker. So much more human type than Here's a side view. This is gorilla. This is Australopithecines and this is human. Again, the U-shaped arch of our teeth, no canine. Australopithecines, okay, the lower canine is much reduced, have a much more U-shaped jaw, okay, thicker enamel, but we still have in the Australopithecines a wide, very strong jaw. The gorilla, wide and strong, big canines, upper and lower. They cannot grind their teeth, they are chompers. It shows you a side view, compares of Australopithecus afarensis skull with that of a chimpanzee. Um, again, you can see the large canines of the chimp. Those have been greatly reduced here. Also, this brain is getting bigger and bigger, okay? And it's also getting more complex with more folds. Here we have a diagram. The humans in the background. On this side is a chimpanzee. And in this side is an Australopithecus afarensis. So you see that they are very similar in size, Australopithecus and chimpanzee. Um, one of the big differences we can note is that chimpanzees have much longer arms and afarensis much shorter. Also notice that the shoulder is changing. Chimps have very little shoulders. They have big musculature for climbing trees. Afarensis is starting to develop a neck and a shoulder. And this indicates that Afarensis is starting to lose agile mobility in the trees. They can still climb trees. They're much better at it than we would be, but they're not as good as a chimpanzee. Now let's look at the pelvis. A chimpanzee 
has this long, narrow pelvis. Australopithecus afarensis has a short, bowl-shaped pelvis. This pelvis is similar to human pelvises. And what it is designed for is bipedal walking. Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy and the others were excellent bipedal walkers. Um, chimpanzees have a long, narrow one, and you see how their femur bows out. The musculature between this is designed for tree climbing and grasping on a tree with four legs. It is not designed for bipedal walking. Australopithecines, we have a large muscle attachment here called the gluteus maximus that goes to the head of the femur. So if you turned Australopithecus around, what you would see is they have a nice rounded tush. They could actually twerk, okay? Their femur bends in to a kneecap that supports a bipedal walker, and their feet are designed for ground walking. The big toe has moved in, it's no longer grasping. For the chimp, they still have an opposable grasping big toe. So very different body types. This is just a close-up of uh, afarensis knee or bipedal walking. Okay, let's compare Lucy with a chimpanzee. Lucy stood upright. When she walked, she had a nice smooth bipedal gait. When chimpanzees stand upright and walk bipedally, they wobble back and forth. You have a YouTube available on your Blackboard website where you can actually compare um, the different walking um, abilities of the different groups. Okay, just a reminder again, humans have a bowl-shaped pelvis. We have a foot that um, is strong and designed to hold up the entire body. Australopithecines have a bowl-shaped pelvis and a foot designed to support the entire body. Chimpanzees have a long, narrow-shaped pelvis, and they have feet that are designed to grasp onto tree limbs and help them walk through a forest. This is a reconstruction of two australopithecines. Um, australopithecine fossils have predominantly been found in East Africa in volcanic areas. And in one time, millions of years ago, a volcano had spewed out volcanic ash. It looks like snow in this reconstruction, but it's actually warm volcanic ash. At that time, two Australopithecines and their social group, it looks like they move in a social group, walked through the warm ash. And behind their footprints, the ash hardened and was covered and paleoanthropologists found it millions of years later. And you can see the footprint. You could find a footprint like this on any of the New York beaches during the summer. It is the footprint of a bipedal walker. We also have um, many Australopithecus afarensis babies. And what's good about a baby is you can look at growth patterns of the teeth and determine growth rates, um, how fast babies grow. And Australopithecus afarensis actually grew at about the same speed of chimpanzees. It's not like the human speed. Human babies are born very very infantile and take a long time to grow up. And part of that has to do with the brain. Because Australopithecus afarensis still has a small brain, their babies can develop fairly quickly. Um, but also take a look at this brain. In this fossil, we were lucky enough to get what we call a brain cast. Um, and this brain cast shows us the interior of the brain. Um, and it shows us that the brain while it's also getting larger, it is getting more folds and more complex um, layers. This is a recreation cute baby, huh? Now, here is a reconstruction of the family. So this large one would have been the male. This one would have been the female, and this is the baby. Now, the male shows sexual dimorphism, which is differences in size and shape between the male and female of the species, the males are larger, which indicates they may have had the job 
uh, protecting the group. Um, looking larger to a predator is a type of defense. We'll talk about that when we talk about bipedal walking. Um, Lucy is, um, this is Lucy, oh, okay. She would have been smaller, about the size of a chimpanzee. Um, but what we wonder about is this, with bipedal walking, what you're going to get is different behavioral changes. Um, and it may create problems for transporting um, babies and infants. Um, remember in other primates, when the baby gets a week or two weeks old, the mother will move the baby onto her back because they're quadrupeds and the baby can cling to the hairs of the mother on her back. But because australopithecines are bipedal, putting the baby on the back does not provide a solid surface for them to cling, um, which means the mother has to help the baby cling, possibly hold it with one arm. Um, and this may make the mother more vulnerable in a dangerous environment. So we have to ask ourselves, how do mothers survive um, and how do they transport the baby? And many scientists think that there was the beginning of cooperation in the social group. So um, the father and other members of the social group would help to protect both the baby and the mother and perhaps uh, participate in some food sharing. Okay, this is just another Australopithecus. You only have to learn Australopithecus afarensis. Um, that is the only group we're really looking at closely. Otherwise, um, other Australopithecines just have a tendency for a larger brain. This is one of the later Australopithecines. This Australopithecine has been found with tools. Um, stone tools is um, an evidence of butchering of animals. Okay, um, these stone tools may look very simple to you, but they do have a sharp cutting edge here. If you remember the video we watched about Kanzi the bonobo, he was using stone tools to cut open a drum, um, and the drum had been capped by uh, the skin of an animal. So stone tools could really help you to butcher an animal. Cut open that skin so you can get at the softer meat inside. These look simple to make, but they're actually very difficult. What you have to do is find a nice smooth stone, and then you have to hit it with another stone to get this flake. And the other stone you hit it with has to be harder than the stone you're using to make the tool with. So it, it requires great planning, abstract thought, and knowledge of your material. Okay, tool use of our early ancestors. What is the significance of tool use? Uh, the first is it indicates the ability for abstract thought. You have to be able to visualize the tool, you have to collect the materials, and you have to perform the right amount of actions to make the tool. We also think it allows for increased survival. You now have the ability to eat foods you couldn't eat before. Um, if you're creating this type of complex tools, does it mean that you have other tools that you can use? Remember, chimpanzees use spears. Um, are there things you could use for protection against some of the large predators in this environment? These are smart animals, so we do think that their survivability increased with their tool use. They also have less need for large teeth or powerful jaws. Remember, Australopithecines do not have that big canines. So they have to cut their foods open um, and sometimes get at the softer um, items that are inside, like hard nuts and tubers, um, and also animals that they kill. It allows new opportunities for food, both plants and animals. And we believe Australopithecines may have started to hunt and also scavenge. Um, many large animals um, in Africa are killed by very large predators. So if a lion takes down a giraffe, 
it would probably be a good idea for the Australopithecine to get away from that scene because other scavengers are going to show up and they could be a danger to the Australopithecines as well. So by the time the predator is eaten and the scavengers, there's usually not much left of the animals. It's basically just bone. What Australopithecines could have done is taken these stone tools and broken open the large leg bones of the animal to get at the marrow inside the bone. Now in our culture, we rarely eat marrow, but it is a source of high nutrition and high energy. So it would have really been a beneficial food for the Australopithecine. Okay, remember I talked about the, Austro the split in the Australopithecine line. This occurred uh, about three million years ago. You get two different groups. One evolved into our ancestors, the genus Homo, and the next lecture we'll look at that group. The other evolved into the genus Paranthropus. Some people call these the robust Australopithecines. So these are not our ancestors. This is the last slide of this lecture, and it's just to show you the Paranthropus genus. Australopithecines evolve into two groups. Our genus Homo evolves from the Australopithecines, and we start to get lighter faces, use more tools, and get a bigger brain. The other group that evolves from the Australopithecines, Paranthropus, starts to develop larger jaws and teeth. Um, they do not develop much larger brains and they do not use tools. Um, they just get this very big face, but they're very successful. They live uh, for millions of years with this adaptation.